What is joy? The world would tell us it's an emotion brought on by well-being, success, or by finally acquiring that one thing we've been chasing. And honestly, that type of joy comes easy in the good times. But what happens to the world's joy when times aren't so good? What if there was a different joy? A true joy that wasn't dependent on good circumstances, but instead a joy that shines brightest in the middle of uncertainty, disappointment, and even suffering. A peace-filled, comforting joy that was so distinct from the world's definition that people couldn't help but take notice. Now that kind of joy, that would be a joy worth pursuing. First Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Now, I'd like to say that this is absolutely true of me, but it's probably not. I have not given up all childish ways. I know that when I was younger, um, you remember those, those uh, school-sponsored events where the kids would go out and sell candy bars to raise funds for the, for the school? Um, I am sure they still have those today. I tend to look for the Girl Scouts more than I do the candy bars, but you start to realize um, this is an incredible program that gets you out there thinking, working, uh, selling, uh, maybe going door to door or whatever it was. I remember in junior high school, um, middle school, probably seventh grade, could have been eighth, they brought us all into an auditorium like this. And they sat us down, they started explaining the, the greatness of going out and selling candy bars and how much that was gonna help the school and help everything. And they brought this, this bicycle and they put this BMX bicycle up there and they said, yeah, and if you sell enough candy bars, you could have a chance at winning this, a draft or a raffle. I remember thinking to myself, like who in the world wants to go and work that hard for a chance? <laughs> this could have been one of the most ridiculous ideas that I've ever heard in my life. You want me to go out, violate the Child Labor Law Act of 1933 <laughs> for a chance at a bike? I don't think so. I remember in graciously donated by the school uh, in print shop when they used to have these kind of things, I made these stickers. And the stickers coincidentally looked an awful lot like the wrapper of those candy bars. And it's amazing when you take that sticker and paste it on the back of a Hershey bar, good old fashioned Hershey bar, you can go out and sell those things for the same cause, but not really for the same cause, if you know what I mean. That's right, I was breaking the law. A rebel, saying to myself, I am not an idiot and I'm gonna go sell candy bars and I'm not gonna sell them for a chance at a bike, I'm gonna sell candy bars and buy my own stinking bike. <laughs> I didn't follow their path. I didn't follow their goal. I thought to myself, I can do this better. But it's not really what following Christ is all about. In fact, I can honestly say in middle school, I knew nothing of Christ. Last week, we ended on Philippians 3, 10 and 11 in particular, where it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This just lays the context for our scripture today in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, which says this. Not that I have already obtained this, this resurrection from the dead, or am already perfect, not fully mature, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. There's a mouthful here of what Paul is communicating to the church at Philippi. But point one for us today is 
seemingly in con contradiction to what point two is gonna be. But point one is this, forget everything. Forget everything that hinders faith and obedience. Anything that is otherwise than Christ Jesus, anything that is otherwise than God, forget about it because that which is not of God hinders faith and obedience. Watch what Paul says in verse 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul, the apostle Paul, he's at the tail end of his life, of his, of his ministry, he's written the vast majority of the New Testament, is saying not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. When you understand the historical grammatical of the words that he's using, it puts it into a whole new light. He says, not I have already obtained this. So what is this? Well, when we go back to 10 and 11, the this is knowing Jesus. It's knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. It's knowing how to share in Christ's suffering. It's knowing he is going to be martyred like Jesus. And the thing that it is not is he is not yet resurrected from the dead. Paul hasn't been completed. He may be extremely mature in Christ, but as long as you're on this side of glory, you have not been fully matured. There's still more to learn, more grace to be had, more knowledge of who Jesus is. And Paul is simply saying that I have not arrived. He says in verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. This knowledge of Jesus, the power of resurrection, the power in shared sufferings, the power of dying like Jesus, the power of the resurrection from the dead. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I love it when someone says one thing I do and then lists two things. Forget what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. You see, the ESV uses the term I do as kind of our English vernacular. And the I do is, of course, not in the original Greek. What Paul is saying only, focus on this, he's saying only one thing. And here's the one thing it's connected. Forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. Forget what hinders you and strive for what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind is what Thomas spoke about last week. You remember his illustration as he pulled a lot of accolades and performance-based things and his family heritage and all those different things and he considered them but rubbish. He threw them in the trash can. Paul was saying in verses three through six, Paul is saying that I'm a chosen people. I'm born of God's chosen people. That's why if anyone could boast, it would be Paul. Not only am I God's chosen people, but I was circumcised on the eighth day as part of the Abrahamic covenant. I've been obedient to the law. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. I have great genealogy. I am the Hebrew of Hebrews, and I have earned the title Pharisee. But he also said that he was a persecutor of the church. Paul marched into these same towns and arrested Christians to have them killed. And that earned him the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was righteous by the law. Paul is declaring, as he did last week in Thomas's sermon, that he is self-righteous. And if he had anything to boast in, it would be him. He could boast and say, I am the Pharisee of Pharisees. But Paul tells us to forget what lies behind. How do you forget? In fact, doesn't God's word tell us over and over again to remember? So why is Paul bringing this aside? Why is he saying forget when scripture itself, remember in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, Paul said, therefore remember 
that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. He says it again. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant, the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, now in present tense, you who once were far off have, from the past, been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul is saying, forget all the self-righteous acolytes, but he's saying, remember past misery and past blessings. Because these are the things that move us and compel us to the blood of Christ, to depend upon him. Luke 9, 9, uh, verses 61 through 62, we hear this. It says, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me be first to say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Your pedigree, your back, your past, The world that you came from is irrelevant to the path that is going forward. Don't look back on the world. Remember Lot's wife coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah? The one simple rule, right? We're gonna march on out of here. God is escorting us out, but don't look back. And she stopped and she looked back and she was turned to a pillar of salt, frozen in her place. Your prize that is before you is in fact the resurrection from the dead. As Christ resurrected, so will those who believe in him. The resurrection from the dead, the glorified state, a glorified body that will be issued to you on the return of Jesus Christ. This is completion. God is transforming you. God is conforming you to the image of himself. And it will be issued at that time of Christ's return. For many of you, maybe you do or don't remember, in 1989, the Tour de France. In the closest uh, tour in history, Greg LeMond against Laurent Fignon, trailing Fignon by 50 seconds at the start of the final stage. And the final stage is in an individual time trial. It's a 15.2 mile race, uh, a sprint to the town of Paris, to the city of Paris. But before the race began, Greg LeMond removed all communication with his team. He told the entire team, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear you in my ear. I don't want to hear you anywhere. I don't want you in a truck beside me telling me I need to pick up the pace. I don't want any influence. I want my eyes fixed on the finish line. I want no distractions. I want no encouragement. I want no help. I want to depend upon the race that is at hand. Many people believed that it was impossible for Lamont to make up 50 seconds on an equal ride with a competitor that is equal in his skill. A 50 second deficit. But he completed the 15.2 mile stage at an average speed of 33.89 miles per hour. The fastest individual time trial ever ridden in the Tour de France up until that point in history. Fignon's time was 58 seconds slower than Le Mans, costing him the victory, and it became Le Mans' second Tour de France title by a margin of only eight seconds. You see what the Apostle Paul is saying, don't look back on your past achievements. Don't look back on your past rides. Don't look back on your past accolades and glorious moments. Don't look at those moments because at the moment that you look back, you will reflect and you will freeze like a pillar of salt, resting in your own laurels, not fixed upon the prize. You see, as the gospel is about growing forward. It's not just about going forward, it's growing forward. We grow in a greater understanding of who this God is. We grow in grace and a greater understanding of who Jesus Christ is. 
The strive forward to what lies ahead is the same that was listed in verses 10 and 11. Strive forward to know him, to know the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, to become like him in his death, and then by any means possible in verse 11, attain the resurrection from the dead. That is your prize. Like a BMX bike, but not so much. This prize is an eternal state with a holy God for all eternity. Paul says, by any means. Does that mean that he can cheat his way to the prize? Like I was doing in the candy bar sales? No. In one breath, Paul says, by any means, but then he quickly defines the spirit of our race, the manner of our race, the manner of the contest, the manner of the journey to the prize. And what Paul is saying here is point two. Not just forget everything that hinders, but remember everything from God. Everything from God serves faith and obedience. God doesn't give you one thing except for the purposes of faith and obedience. In verse 14, he said, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize is in Christ Jesus, this resurrection. You know, I was pretty proud of myself on how many candy bars I had sold at that point in time. In fact, I had enough profit left over from the candy bars to buy two BMX bikes. Until my dad found out. And then my father came to me and he says, son, I was so proud of you. And then I found out that you cheated. You're gonna give every nickel to the, to the school and you will receive no prize. Look at what Paul says in verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call, not the common call, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. You see the goal. The goal is a manner in which you run the race. You have to run the race the right way, under the rules of God, under faith and obedience. The prize is the resurrection. In a glorified state with Christ, you will be issued a new body in perfection that doesn't age, that doesn't get tired, and doesn't get disease, where you will reside with Christ on a new earth for all eternity. The upward call, this is the chief end of man. This is your highest possible purpose, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But how we enjoy him makes the difference, the manner in which we run the race. You see, Paul said, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now we can use the word in in three different kind of texts or tones. In can mean spatially. It can mean inside or at or among or with Christ Jesus. Or it can point to time, during the time of Christ Jesus. While Christ Jesus. But the logical use here is by means of Christ Jesus because of Christ Jesus. Paul is saying, press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God by means of Christ Jesus. And then he looks at it the flip side. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if you use by means of anything that otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Just like my father revealed to me that selling candy bars under fraud is wrong. Your heavenly father will tell you every single time that you're living your life like Paul pointed to in a self-righteous manner and not by means of Christ alone. 
The upward call, the prize, is the resurrection from the dead. But Paul uses this term. He says, let those of us who are mature. This word mature is the word teleos. It means perfect, it means mature, it means finished or complete. Paul speaks with this incredible confidence and with an absolute certainty when he says, if you otherwise, if you think otherwise, other than in that maturity of in Christ or by means of Christ, then you're lacking and God will in fact reveal that to you. Not God might reveal it to you, God will reveal that to you. We see the same word used in the King James Version of Philippians 3.15. It says, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. So the word mature or perfect here is not pointing that you will actually obtain one day an absolute perfection here. But you will obtain a perfection that comes at the second coming when you receive a matured or a glorified body. Probably some word pictures from scripture might help us with this. 1 Corinthians 13, nine through 11 says, for now, right, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, that word teleos there, when the maturity, when the completion comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. I am matured. God is always maturing us. He uses in this text, of course, teleos perfect or mature or finished. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 20. It says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be teleos, be mature. Or Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, it's for the teleos. For those who have their powers, listen to what maturity is, right? It's not an age. It's a point in time when you have the power of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. You see what Paul said in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already fully completed in maturity. He uses the verb form of it in teleo rather than teleos. <clears throat> in the verb form, it means to perfect or to complete or to finish. Or in the passive, it means to reach a goal or to be made perfect. Paul is literally saying, this guy who's written the vast majority of the New Testament is at the tail end of his life, is imprisoned and suffering for Christ's sake. He's recognizing all of these things and he's saying, I have not yet arrived. Then neither have I. Neither of you. Verse 15, he then says, because of that, let those of us who are mature think this way. Tell us. What way are we supposed to think? Not like a child, not inexperienced, but experienced to your current stage of life. Brothers and sisters, we get this so wrong. We think that God is preparing for us to be great sometime in the future. The fact of the matter is what Paul is saying here is that you have been perfected at this moment and are ready to go. Because it's not by you, it's by means of Christ Jesus. I don't care if you came to know Jesus three minutes ago, you are adequately equipped with the Holy Spirit to present the gospel to the person on your left and your right. Not by your means, but by means of Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have to stop thinking like children. We have to stop saying that when I become, you need to take on the spiritual warfare that is at hand. 
and take on the faculties of discernment. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 1, going all the way back, Philippians 1, 6 and 7. Paul says with great confidence, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion when? At the day of Christ Jesus, at the resurrection, your resurrection, new glorified body. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of what? Of grace. Both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. He is sure, he is confident that he who began a good work in you will complete that work. And if you're doing anything by means of self or anything else, God will reveal that to you. That's his promise. When you see the blessing take place, it's incredible. Matthew 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. Look at that. Peter is saying to him, to Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. It's not by any other means. But my father who is in heaven. You see, everything you have, your, your wealth, your, your health, your mind, your everything is by means of Christ Jesus. You're sustained by it. A friend of mine who is dying of brain cancer who lives down in Queen Creek told me the other day, he says, Jeff, he says, you know how big the tumor is that's inside my brain? I said, oh. He says, it's a grain of rice. He says, now press your fingers together. He says, that's God holding that grain of rice because I'm supposed to be dead now. But God keeps his fingers on that grain of rice because there is yet more to grow in his grace and there is yet more to do for the advancement of his kingdom. And he's holding that grain of rice. It hasn't grown, it hasn't shrunk. All praise to God. He says, and he's holding it until he's not and then he takes me home. Oh, to have this mindset, to think this way, to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the son of the living God. And we are blessed, why? Because flesh and blood, as much as I wanna take credit for sharing the gospel every Sunday that I preach, or Bob, or Thomas, or Mark, or Ed, or Joe, it doesn't matter who's up here sharing the gospel because it has nothing to do with me and it has everything, everything to do with Christ and Christ alone. If you walk out of here with any value, with any education, drop to your knees and thank the Lord because it didn't come from me, it came from him and him alone. It doesn't come from us. We may be the vehicle that delivers it, but it is the Holy Spirit and the power of God that reveals to you the very things that you're holding on to that aren't Christ. And like Thomas last week, maybe you need to throw them in the rubbish, discard of them. Because if you lack anything, if you think otherwise, then you're not at that point of maturity in thinking this way. So what will he reveal? Philippians 1, backing up, 9 and 11. 9 through 11, it says, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Why? So that you may approve what is excellent. So that you'd know what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless when for the day of Christ Jesus when he comes back to give you your glorified body. And at that point, you will be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, not through you or the things you've done, and to the glory and the praise of God. What is the knowledge of, and discernment? 
Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. Paul said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and a revelation God will reveal to you in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, discernment, that you may know what is the hope that which has called you that what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. You see, it's all about the Father's glory, that he would give you a spirit of wisdom, that he would reveal to you the knowledge of him and give you the discernment of eyes in your heart to be enlightened with truth, so that you will know what is hope, that you'll know the glorious inheritance, the resurrection, and that you would know the immeasurable greatness of his power. God will reveal the things in your life that are by means otherwise than him. And he's gonna do this by illuminating the heart to know him knowing that we share in his death, that we share in his suffering, and we ultimately share by means in the power of our bodies being resurrected from the dead. Leads you to Paul's conclusion here. Point three, hold true to what we have attained. If you know all these things, then hold true to them. Don't look back, hold true. Because verse 16, only he says, only let us hold true to what we have attained. What have you attained? Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work and you will complete that work to the end of the age. You attained the Holy Spirit. You already have the Holy Spirit in you. You see, there's no excuse as to why you can't join us in our care ministry. There's no excuse why you can't serve. There's no excuse why you can't take your next step for the kingdom of God, because this is the race. And if you continue to look back, you're frozen, you're paralyzed, and you're not fixed on the prize. This is what Paul is saying. Only let us hold true. Our responsibility is to hold true and to press on, to strive to the goal. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 2, 12 to 13. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more when I am absent, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, working out your salvation, not working for your salvation. Taking the salvation, the, that which he's already given you, and work it out. That's human effort. God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, is God's supernatural work in you. God will reveal. So that you can both hold true to what you know and press on, move and grow forward. Because he who began a good work in you, that which you've attained, has much more to come, maturity, and ultimately eternity with him. Hold true to what you have attained and press on towards that fullness, that completion of the race. As I call the band back up, I want to leave you with just several takeaways. I want you to forget everything that hinders your faith and obedience. Throw it away. All things that are a means of self-righteousness. If you're holding on to that childhood trophy and still pointing to it, throw it away. If you're thinking that your academic credentials earns you favor with God, throw it away. If you're thinking that your genealogy and your pedigree is worth something, renounce it. If you're thinking that there's anything that is not of God that you're hanging on to, discard it. 
because we must remember everything that we've received from God serves to grow our faith and our obedience. All things by the means of Christ Jesus are for you to keep your eye on the prize. Hold true to what we have attained. Because those that are mature think this way. How must we think? To know him, to know the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings. Don't become arrogant and say that I've arrived when you haven't. He will complete his work in you and that you will in fact know he is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God who lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death. He conquered death through resurrection and he ascended to the right hand of God the Father where right now, this moment, he is making an intercession on your behalf so that you will be revealed in all the things that you're holding on to that are not by means of Christ Jesus. <laughs> our Father and our God, help us to live by Christ alone. The Lord, even when we can't see you, you are in fact still working. Help us, Lord, to grow truly in your grace and to grow in a greater and a greater understanding of your Son. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. He is Lord of all. He is the master that we are here to serve. Brothers and sisters, I can't encourage you enough. Today, will you take your next step? Stop by Info Syndrome. If you don't even know what the next step is, just go out there, give them your name and say, I want to take my next step. Or if you want, next week, next Sunday, I'm hosting lunch and a training session on how to get involved in care ministry, how to serve how to visit our widows, how to pray for those who are in the hospital, how to prep meals, how to help someone move, how to love God, how to love people, to make disciples. It is all by means of Christ alone, nothing of ourselves. You are fully equipped for where God has you in your season right now. Take your next step. To God be the glory. May we glorify you in all that we say, in all that we do, by means of Christ in Christ alone. Amen. I love you guys. We'll see you next week. <laughs>